Hello, it's Sparky Pete in Liverpool, coming to you from the International Science Centre, which is also doubles as my mum's garage. And I'm going to take you through the electrical installation condition report and specifically talk about the, the classification of codes. There's some guidance in front of you. The one on the left hand side is the old um, safety council, one electrical safety council. And the one on the uh, the right hand side is, as you can see, Electrical Safety First. I mean, they're basically the same organisation. The one on the left is the older one, and the one on the right is the uh, the most recent. And the one on the left came out in 2011, and the one on the right came out in 2014. Looking through them, it's the same document. I mean, the only thing that's different there is the cover, really. Uh, the information I've just flicked them over, you know, page. I do. I'm done a page by page comparison, and it's the same document. It could probably do a little bit of updating that now, but to get the the basic message across, the concept about how we classify the code, it's it's uh, it's ideal for us. Um, it does say in there that um, it's taken into account changes of the First Amendment of the 17th edition when that was 2011. So we're a few years out of date there. But like I say, um, when we inspect and test, um, when we carry out condition reporting, the uh, it's the application of the regs, isn't it? So a lot of the time, the, the concepts we use and the routines and practices that we, we carry out, uh, they don't necessarily change. It's just that the regs we're applying to the installations are different. Now, I'm very aware with this one, it's gonna be a controversial one uh, because everyone's got their own opinion about um, what classification we give to different, um, you know, electrical problems, etc. But if you, if you, um, obviously, I'm going to say at the end, or I'll say it now again. Any constructive feedback is always appreciated, but I'll struggle to take you seriously if you haven't read that document first. And what I suggest as well is pause the video now, go on the Electrical Safety Council. I'll put the the link up. Download that document. Have a have a quick uh, shifty through. And, and then uh, and then do the exercise because you'll be a lot better informed. So um, that's my suggestion anyway. Here's the codes we can use. C1, C2, C3. C1 is danger present, risk of injury, immediate remedial action required. C2, potentially dangerous, urgent remedial action required. And C3, improvement recommended. Now, if we record either a C1 or a C2, we've got to say that the installation's unsatisfactory, a fail effectively. We can record C3s and still say, satisfactory c3s tend to come about through minor things or sometimes where um obviously when the regulations change an installation doesn't suddenly become unsafe overnight so a lot of the times when we record a c3 is because of uh, changes in the regulation the other way we're going to feed back on the documentation is if it's uh, acceptable it's good and it's there it gets a tick uh, i've talked about the c1 c2 c3 uh, other things we can say is that um it requires further investigation. We just couldn't get to it during the scope of the inspection. Uh, not verified. I'll leave you to think about that one. Limitation if we just can't get to some something. Obviously, we've got agreed limitations up front, but there might be limitations um, that crop up uh, on the day. Um, not applicable. Simply that the fact that, um, that that particular aspect doesn't apply to this installation. So, for example, if we don't have a room containing a bath or a shower, then anything connected with a room containing a bath or a shower is going to be not applicable. So, so that, they're the ways we can feed back. Um, we've got uh, C1, C2, C3, and uh, the other uh, types of condition on there. There's the board that you might be familiar with with the previous uh, visual inspection exercise. Now, I want to show you these defects. I'd like you to just home in on what I'm saying to you about the defectors. I mean, you might observe, well, you will, you'll observe other things in view, but just pay attention to the specific de defect that I'm talking about. So, first one is the fact that we've got planks missing from this consumer unit. The second one is that on this twin earth cable, which is installed on the surface, we've got insulation missing and live conductors are exposed here even though we've got the water let's say the top one's the water even though we've got the water bonded 
and that's a main protective bond onto the water on the right hand side and we've even got a supplementary bond coming off the water on the left hand side goes to up there to that double pull switch um the bottom we'll call that the gas and we'll say that the gas has not been bonded there's no main protective bond to the gas here's another one that we had before in the last visual inspection exercise there's no cpc at that light switch i've gone to another consumer unit now which is perfectly feasible in the uh, the same inspection and what i want to show you here is the fact that there's no rcd test notice it's just that here we've got a lighting circuit, circuit number three, and in the main earthing terminal, the CPC for that circuit, instead of being in way three, is in way six. So the CPC has been um, connected up in the wrong place. At inspection, you're going to agree the limitations up front with the client, and the requirement came some years ago to actually write an individual's name down about who you've agreed these limitations with. But here in this situation, we've come to, just on the day, we've come to a door that we can't open and we know there's part of the electrical installation in there how are we going to record that this first lighting circuit which is uh, a b6 uh, 6098 breaker has recorded a value of 10 ohms and the so that's a fail because the value in the gn3 is 5.82 that socket circuit that you can see, uh, a B32 6098 breaker, uh, that circuit when tested has recorded a low insulation resistance value of 2 mega ohms between live conductors and earth. We've got cables here that are less than 50 mil in the building fabric and obviously they're supposed to be in the safe zones but we don't know whether they're in the safe zones or not. So how do we record that on the documentation in the report? Also, there's no RCD protection for those cables which we know are buried in the building fabric, which we can assume are less than 50 mil. So, how did you do? Number one, the blanks missing. And just, just that, we're aware of other things there, but just the blanks missing. Hopefully you recorded that as a C1. Obviously somebody could have put the finger in there, get a belt, so anything like that, under that situation, it's a C1. Now with something like that, we deal with that straight away, one way or another, you know. Um, in that situation, we might have some blanks with us and we might just simply put them in. In another situation, you would make maybe some kind of minor repair or isolate the affected circuits. So we're going to do something about that straight away. It's a C1. When we uh, record that on the documents, we don't um, act as if it's all gone away and disappeared. Um, we would record that as potentially C1, you know, now rectified, just to let the client know that uh, there was an issue and we've now uh, rectified that issue. That's a conversation you need to have up front with the client about how you're going to react to uh, issues like that where there's a clear and present danger. Again, the uh, exposed live conductors, the twin earth cable, that's a C1. That's a shock risk, isn't it, straight away. So, C1 for that. So this is the point where some people are going to start to have steam coming out of their ears because that is a C2. Because a C2 is potentially dangerous. So C1s, you've got a clear and present danger. You've got a shock risk there straight away. But here, it's only potentially dangerous, isn't it? You know, it only becomes dangerous when we get yeah, a fault voltage on that pipe work, you know. Okay, so that's potentially dangerous, isn't it, under the right circumstances. Again, controversial for some of you. Read the guidance. No earth at the light switch again. That's a C2. Now, some of you are gonna to struggle to accept that one, but it's potentially dangerous under given circumstances. No RCD test notice. Now, according to the guidance, um, that is a C3, improvement recommended. And the fact that we've got the CPCs out of order there, again, according to the guidance, that is a C3. Now, with this, I'm expecting controversy. And I welcome it to, to be honest because it, it might make uh, people read the guidance that I've uh, shown you and other guidance as well. And for us all to try and get some kind of harmonious way of, of feeding back. Because like I say, when I talk to people and hear their opinions, everybody seems to have their own idea about how we record these uh, defects. And it's in the benefit of all, including the consumer, you know, to have a harmonised system uh, between us electricians. And the locked door, that's a limitation. Again, how do you deal with that? Because when you uh, are pricing for periodic inspections, then what you've got to do with the client is agree on the time that you're going to be there and also the number of circuits that you're going to test. 
if you just say, oh yeah, domestic premises is X amount and you turn up and there's 35 circuits there, which I've had, obviously that's not lots more work for you then. And if you've got to come back and verify bits and pieces, obviously that's inconvenient and it's more work for you as well. So got to be a bit of a diplomat with these uh, periodic inspections. The lighting circuit with the high ZS value, that again is a C2. And we'd also record further investigation because there's not much more we can say about that until we start to investigate. Again, these are things that you, your client needs to be aware of, possibly up front, to consult with them over that one. So that's one for another day, isn't it, that one? At the moment, all we can say is that that, uh, that, that circuit isn't going to disconnect within the required time, and therefore it's potentially dangerous. And the socket circuit, we've recorded a value of 2 mega ohms. Now, it's an interesting number, isn't it, that one, 2 mega ohms, because the regs tells us, you know, 1 mega ohm. So, strictly speaking, we could say, oh, that's a pass, but we know a value uh, as low as that is a problem. So, we'd record that as a C2, potentially dangerous. We don't know what's going on there, you know. That could uh, worsen, you know, pretty quickly. So, potentially dangerous and further investigation required there. Whether these cables are in prescribed zones or not, that's an interesting one for you because you might say, oh, limitation, you know, I can't uh, get underneath the plastic and see what's going on there. But a limitation implies that maybe uh, that you might come back and do something about that at a later date, you know, when, you, when there are no limitations. But with this one here, you're not going to come back another day, are you, and take the plaster off the walls or lift floorboards up, etc. Or even necessarily go into building voids, you know, that's all on the... Uh, notice isn't it the fact that the, the scope of, of what we're doing here so that one possibly not verified that one we can't verify that one and there's no RCD protection for these cables that are uh, installed in the building fabric now if you read the guidance I've been talking about that goes down as a, a code 3 uh, improvement recommended that means that according to the guidance and read it before you come back to me if that's all it was for the premises in question, we could record that as uh, code three, improvement recommended, and still say satisfactory, and walk away and let the clients have a think about it. So there we go, like the blue touch paper, hey? Let's let's have a debate about this one, because we, we need to. So it'll be interesting to see. That's what the guidance says, you know, and um, I agree with a lot of it. I can, you know, I could find criticism for others, but I think that those best practice guide or that best practice guide, which is the latest one, I mean, I've said it the same thing, is a good place to start for getting kind of a handle on it. You know, the fact that some things are out and out dangerous and we need to sort them out straight away. Everything else is potentially dangerous, but under the right circumstances, you know, no one's going to die at that minute. This is what we're saying there, you know, hopefully. And then there's a whole load of things uh, which are C3s. Uh, um, there's other things as well, if you read the guidance, which commonly get recorded as defects, which shouldn't be recorded at all. Again, uh, uh, I'm encouraging it. I'm pushing this guidance, aren't I? So again, hopefully a lot of you will read the guidance. And maybe um, top of the class, if you're one of the ones who downloaded it and read it before doing the exercise, which is what I suggested. What I'm aware of with this subject is it's an absolute free-for-all. I mean, you talk to different electricians and they're going to give you different advice. Now, I, I always say about inspection and testing that you will get conflicting advice from reputable sources. And that's an interesting one, isn't it, that one? And for someone who's learning, you think, well, who do I believe? Do I believe that book? Do I believe that book? Do I believe him? Do I believe her? You know, so uh, I can understand why people get confused about this subject. Uh, but at least this is, this is why I like to look at the... Um, the electrical safety first document because at least it gives you some kind of method some kind of approach for categorizing different electrical issues so sparky beats signing off uh, i can't wait to hear your responses on this one um like i say you know um nobody knows everything and there's always more to say and a lot more on this particular subject